a good Wednesday evening to you. Now then, we can begin with a word of prayer. I'll be glad to do that. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful evening. Thank you for these dear friends, these good folks gathered to hear your word, consider it, and pray together for the needs of the church. We thank you for your glory and grace to us through Christ Jesus. Now bless our time together, we pray humbly. This name, amen. Hello, Phyllis. Well, if you were to turn to 1 Corinthians 10, and if we were to read in 1 Corinthians 10, that uh, the Apostle Paul, referring to Israel's journey, and they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Well, that's an interesting thing to say, that rock was Christ. Remember what I spoke on the last time I uh, was here for Wednesday night? I spoke about Joseph as being a type of Christ. And we just enumerated the many ways in which Joseph um, was a, a type. Now, what I want to do tonight is continue along those lines and uh, consider what a type is. It's a type, first of all, has been variously defined in church history as a, something that occurs in the Bible, a person, an institution that foreshadows the coming of God. And so, type, it's a biblical word. It's used by the Apostle Paul in Romans 5. It's used in Hebrews. And um, they use other words as well. Um, for instance, they say the law and its festivals were shadows. That's kind of a type of the And we see another Matthew and Paul said, So we're not trying to read Jesus back into the Old Testament. The apostles followed Jesus' methodology. And do you remember what his methodology was when looking at the Old Testament and referring to himself? In Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, they're on the road to Emmaus. And... Uh, Jesus says in verse, well, it says of him in verse 27 of chapter 24 of Luke, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he specifically mentioned the name of Moses. What happened to Moses? A foreshadowing himself. So, but the word type is a biblical word, and we're not trying to read into the scriptures. We're simply trying to understand from the scriptures uh, how Jesus, hundreds, thousands of years before he arrived. Second, so first of all, type is a biblical word. It's not something we made up. It's found in scripture itself. And secondly, biblical types are historical. Play. Typology speak of metaphysical realities or philosophical conditions. We're not talking about that. We're talking about real historical figures or institutions. In the Old Testament, God introduces people. He introduced events and institutions to bring Israel to an understanding of what salvation is. These types repeated over and over called escalation when you get these types. For instance, who was the type in the Old Testament, type of Christ? The New Testament, Adam. Adam was the first one. And then you see Abel was a type of Christ. And even Seth was a type of Christ. But Noah and Enoch and Melchizedek keeps building and building and building and different features of the coming Messiah. Uh, so 
uh, they're historical. Biblical types are historical. They're, they spring from the pages of the Old Testament. And uh, in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ himself came to fulfill that all these types had, had uh, represented or, or typified. And so they littered their gospel message with the Old Testament language and imagery, the apostles did. And types must be clearly discernible from the biblical text and not just uh, an imagination of the one who's trying to interpret things. Again, that's kind of eisegesis of reading into the text. No, the pieces of the puzzle together and you say, oh, I understand how, in the sense that he was the represented humanity, and, and Christ is a type of federal Adam. So it's very clear in the scriptures. It's not something that you have to come up with a system to build to read it back into the scriptures. Now what does typology do? Well, three things I would suggest that uh, for us as we look at these Old Testament figures. Uh, typology unites the Old Testament with the New Testament. And vice versa. Looking back on the Old Testament, John could see how the servant lifted up in the wilderness. The serpent on that pole in Numbers 21. How it represented those who had been stung by the vipers was to look to that serpent on that brass. And Jesus himself would later say, and I lifted up. I will draw all men to myself. And so John the apostle could see that. And Paul could read the story of Sarah and Hagar as written as, a, as an uh, allegory. And, uh, and so he talks about that in Galatians, you remember. Well, uh, so God orchestrated these biblical types over these years, persons, events, institutions, whose full meaning can't be really understood until the coming of Christ. What's an institution, for instance, in the Old Testament that was fulfilled in Christ? Uh, we've talked about persons, Adam, Noah, Abel, Melchizedek, David, Joseph, Moses, Jonah. There's lots of persons, but what's an institution that, but that was a type that was fulfilled in Jesus? It's an easy one. You really know it. The, the tabernacle. The tabernacle. Every implement, every piece of furniture represented the work of Christ. And, and thus, the temple that followed it as well. So... It unites, typology unites the New Testament. So it gives the reader a confidence that this is a miraculous book. It's written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years, and yet there's an amazing unity to it. And for all these figures and institutions in here clear, re, clearly represent Jesus as he fulfills them all. And so it gives the, the believer uh, a confidence in the word of God, I think. Secondly, typology identifies who Jesus is. And so for the apostles, it became a dominant way to explain who his identity was. He was born in Jewish soil, in, in a whole Jewish context. And the apostles spoke of Jesus as prophet and priest and king. And so they intended to connect him with Moses, for instance. Uh, they intended to priest Melchizedek. Moses was a prophet, Melchizedek was a priest, and David was a king. And there's clear, he was the son of David. And when they sang Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they were saying Hosanna, son of David. And so when John says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he's using typology. He's using that paschal lamb, that lamb that was slain for the Passover. Jesus is that lamb. So it's, uh, it, it clearly comes from the pages uh, of the word of God. And, and it, what it is doing is explaining the identity of the Son of God, Messiah, Jesus. And then thirdly, typology reveals the wisdom of God's progressive revelation. He doesn't tell us everything at once. He begins with Evangelion, uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, where he promises the serpent that he would crush the heel of the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. 
He would wound the heel. But the, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Uh, we, we see that how aggressively uh, uh, unfolds throughout the mid-centuries. And so he's hinting at, he's concealing his son in all these types and shadows fully revealed in the New Testament. So there's a definite connection there. That's all about the identity of Jesus. Now, so for I'd like for us for just a few minutes this evening, I've given you, be helpful to you. Uh, I'm not going to follow that sheet in terms of my remarks, but um, you can, you can, uh, most definitely a type of Christ. You don't have to strain in reading his, the saga and see how he is foreshadowing the coming of Moses. One, Deuteronomy 18 he says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Now, what are the qualities of this prophet that's going to come? That's going to be, he says he's going to have these qualities. He'll be raised up by God, and he will come from among the Israelites, and he will be like Moses. Of giving hear, e, uh, heed to and obeying. He will be a, a colossal on the same uh, level as a Moses. So, uh, does Jesus fulfill those things? He does in every way. The prophet who fulfills the words that Moses speaks is Jesus of Nazareth, and only Jesus of Nazareth does he fulfill in all those ways, raised up by. To the Jordan River, the Jews questioned John the Baptist about who he was and uh, why he was baptizing. You know what they asked him in John chapter 1 and verse 21? They said, are you the prophet? They didn't say, are you a prophet? They said, John, are you the prophet? What prophet? The prophet that Moses spoke, that one greater than me will come. And of course, John plainly told them that no. He was the one who pointed to the prophet. There was one coming, however... He said, among you stands one you do not know. He's the one who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Of the Messiah as one predicted that God would raise up one among them, from among you. That's what he said, those words in Deuteronomy 18.15. So the Israelites, among the seekers after God, and so the very next day, John specifically identifies Jesus of Nazareth as the one they were waiting for. And then in his sermon at the temple, the apostle Peter affirms that Jesus is the whom Moses. See that in Acts 3.22. Words of Moses there that one will come after me. And when Stephen addresses the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7, three people of God in the Old Testament and uh, quotes Moses and applies the prophecy directly to Jesus Christ. So you see, we don't have to read it into it. It's plainly stated by Peter, by Stephen. And of course, it's, of course, it's very evident, even by the words that Moses spoke, that the only New Testament figure that could have fulfilled what he was saying was Jesus of Nazareth. And so Jesus is ways. Have you thought about that before? Remember we talked about how Joseph was like Jesus. Uh, he was rejected by his brothers and how he was raised up to be a provider, a savior, a deliverer. Well, we see that Jesus is like Moses in several ways. Moses was of course we identify commandments with Moses, don't we? God and he gave remember what his commandments were and okay so those are the greatest of the commandments right and they encompass the ten commandments right there you have the commandments refer to our relationship with God right 
And so, love the Lord your God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. That means you'll have no other gods before him. That means you won't create any images to worship this, this God. And it means that you'll honor his name and honor the day that he has set aside. So those first four commandments have to do with loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And loving your neighbors yourself, well, those are commandments 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, starting with your parents. And so Jesus just encapsulates all of them uh, and escalates them really into just the two great commandments. But he's the lawgiver, and his law, we often say this about Jesus, that his is the law of love. So, Jesus was a prophet and a lawgiver, just like Moses, and both Moses and Jesus mediated a covenant between God and man. For Moses, it was the old covenant. Now, Moses was building on the old covenant that had come before him, that had been cut with Abraham. Moses was in about uh, 1900 B.C. And here Moses is the... the, the uh, Covenant is expanding, and Moses is delivering the, the old commandment, I mean old covenant, but he's building on the covenant that was cut with Abraham. But Jesus introduces a new covenant, doesn't he? We see that very clearly in where he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And both Moses and Jesus were born during perilous times. Do you think that that was a coincidence? <laughs> that Pharaoh was after these Jewish children, these males. He was after them, out, out to get them. And he was foiled in his attempt. And in a beautiful way, God used a, a member of his own court to, to save, spare, and... To, kings or pharaohs that were intent on destroying God's prophet. And of course, it was Herod who was out to get Jesus. And Matthew tells us then about the innocent slaughter that went on there in Bethlehem in the region there. So both Moses and Jesus had a connection to Egypt, didn't they? Uh, interestingly enough, Jesus, his family, Joseph, fled to Egypt to escape mad Herod. And... Uh, Moses was born in, in Egypt and was tightly related to it. So there's that Egypt connection for both of them. But Moses was the adopted son of a king, son of a pharaoh, and Je Jesus is the son of the Most High. So they're alike in that way, and that they were royal. And Moses spent 40 years as a shepherd. The book of Exodus tells us. 40 years in the Midianite wilderness. He calls himself the good shepherd. Peter calls him that great shepherd. Interesting, this characteristic, this personality trait, this virtue, as far as I know, it's only mentioned of these two. Do you remember where uh, in your reading uh, of the Moses saga throughout that whole, uh, the law, the Torah, it says that Moses was the meekest man of his whole generation. There was none meeker than uh, What did Jesus say about himself? He says, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. So both of these royal sons, Moses and Jesus, were known for their meekness. That particularly... We read about Moses in Numbers 12, 3, that he was the meekest man of, of uh, his generation and that Jesus was certainly identifying himself as meek. And Moses and Jesus were alike in that they both were deliverers. And that's really the big picture, the big picture comparison without getting into all these specific little weeds that are fun and are clearly there in Scripture. But you, don't have, you don't have to read it into it. It's clearly, you see that correlation, that parallel that they're much alike. But in the big picture, Moses was a deliverer, and so was Jesus. Uh, Moses, of course, led the Israelites out of physical bond and physical slavery to Egypt. And Jesus, with even greater power, leads God's elect out of our spiritual bondage and our slavery to sin. But definitely deliverers. 
rescuers. And, and Moses stood before Pharaoh and cried out, Let my people go. And Jesus said that he had come. And when he stood before that congregation at the synagogue in Nazareth, he read from the scroll of Isaiah 61 to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and to set the oppressed free. That's why he had come, to proclaim freedom. And so you see, that was the, the heart cry of Moses and Jesus, was freedom, physical freedom from Egypt and spiritual freedom from the bondage of our sins. Christ Jesus, the law of the life, has set you free from the law of sin Moses and Jesus alike, obviously. Well, most are miracles. Remember when God gave him, said, you're going to use this staff, you're going to go before Pharaoh, and if he's stubborn, throw that staff down, it would turn into a serpent. Now, that was a miracle, but uh, interestingly enough, the demon-influenced magicians of Egypt could... Uh, could uh, mimic that. Could not turn the Nile River back clean after Moses had turned it to blood. They couldn't do that. So Moses was like Jesus in that he performed miracles. And not all prophets did miracles. Um, several of the miracles that Moses, what he did, uh, resembled Jesus. What he did. Most, probably the most obvious one was that he provided bread. For the masses in the wilderness. It was manna. He didn't, God provided it, but he and people, and how God uh, for 40 years rained down manna for them every day. Well, that's comparable to Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 and later the 4,000. In fact, after Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, the people's thoughts ran immediately to Moses. They remembered Moses' prophecy in John 6. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the prophet that Moses did. Because he's doing what Moses did. Bread. He's giving us bread. And so another way that Moses was like Jesus is that he held intimate conversations with God. The Bible says the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend, Exodus 33, 11. And of course, Jesus had that special relationship with him too. He said that the Father knows me and I know the Father and no one knows the Father really except the Son. Of course, there was that intimate connection that Jesus had with his Father. Had an intimate relationship with God. And you might remember this, when Moses came down from the mountain, his face Shown. You know, when money has the little horns on top of the head, do you recall that in your art history books or just in your? Uh, that's because that word in Hebrew that, that says uh, glory sounds a lot like the word for horns. And, uh, and so, Moses' countenance glowed. He even had to put a veil on it. And when the, he was a little bit sad, or a lot sad maybe, when that glory began to diminish in time, and he dropped the veil. But his face glowed because he had been with God. And then do you remember in Matthew 17, Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration. And what does the scripture tell us about it? It says, his face shone like the sun. It was a brilliant white, too, that surrounded him. And so there was a little bit of the glory of God that was unveiled for Peter, James, and John to see on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he was transfigured, and a glimpse of the glory of heaven shone in Jesus' face. It was like the sun. It was a physical phenomenon, as it was with Moses. And that's what happens when you're with God in the way that they were with God. Okay? Okay? Another important way that Moses was like Jesus, constantly interceding for his people. When the Israelites sinned, he was standing by, ready to petition God on their behalf and plead for their forgiveness. Uh, 
even after the blatant idolatry and the gross carrying on and, and, and the, involving the golden calf, Moses interceded twice for the people. And it was needed at other times as well. It was temporary on an as-need basis. And the need seemed to be fairly frequent when he would intercede for his people. But the beautiful thing about Jesus, constant, always, always interceding. I think about the work of Christ, and I like to think, based on his own words to us, that he's preparing a place for us. I don't know how long that takes, and I don't know how, what kind of uh, dwelling we'll have. Maybe mine won't take too long. Maybe he finished mine a long time ago. Uh, but uh, some are going to require some real work. Well, he's doing that, but he's also interceding for the saints before the Father with the Holy Spirit. And that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? That Moses was an intercessor, and certainly Jesus is on a constant basis. John reminds us that if any one of us sins, or when we sin, really, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, who is the accuser? Satan, a baden. We've got a, an accuser and an advocate, and the advocate is great. <laughs> so Jesus is now at the right hand of God, interceding for us, Romans 8.34 says, and he always or ever lives to intercede for us, Hebrews 7.25. Not only was he an intercessor like Jesus, but Moses was willing to die for his people. Exodus 32.32 says that he offers his life in exchange for the sinners. The Bible tells us that greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Moses was willing to do that. And, of course, our Lord Jesus proved it when he did lay down his life for us. So, you see, uh, maybe your paper there gives you some other ways. They were both kings, right? And Moses was king of Jeshurun, and Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. Both of them, uh, what did they do? They, they, they did miracles on the sea, too, didn't they? Moses stopped the Red Sea, or God did it, but Moses was his man. And... Uh, of course, Jesus quieted the storm and the seas. And so there's a number of other ways, little small ways in which you see, wow, Moses did that and Jesus did it too. That's because Moses is a type of Christ to come. He's foreshadowing the ministry of Jesus. Now, so we talked about what typology is and uh, what it does for us. Now, we need to understand too, Moses is a great example of type in the Old Testament that prefigures Christ. Today needs typology uh, because God is in the business of saving people, but he does it through the means of faith in his gracious promises. And so the Old Testament saints couldn't understand the virgin birth. They couldn't understand the Roman crucifixion. It hadn't even been invented for them. But they could believe in the shadows of the cross. They could believe that sin is so terrible and we're all guilty and so we need a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. So sacrifice must be made. They knew that. And so they looked forward to the shadows of the cross, not fully understanding it. And that's why Paul speaks of the gospel that was preached beforehand to, through type and shadow to, to like Noah and Abraham and Moses and David. They got of Jesus Christ and they believed in the promises of God as much as the revelation had been unfolded to them. They bought into it. And that now here we are situated on the other side of redemptive history. They were looking forward to the cross. We're looking back. and We understand how these types work so that we can rightly understand God's word. We can interpret appropriately and respond to God's son. And so this is why typology is legitimate, it's useful, it's necessary, it's a fruitful means of knowing the God who made this world to glorify himself and resemble his son. So Paul understood this when he referred to that rock in the desert as Christ. Christ was that rock. And so 
you might just uh, go home this evening or in your studies this week, uh, ask yourself, uh, can I, could I name 10 different human beings in the Old Testament that prefigured Christ? We named almost that many when we started uh, tonight. But there, there are more. There are a number of institutions, events like Passover, institutions like the temple, and people like Adam and even Abel uh, and Moses and Joseph who are types of our Lord Jesus Christ. It uh, strengthens our faith, I think, to understand what a, what a wonderful book this is that prepares the hearts of people, prepares our hearts as we begin to read from Genesis through and see it unfold, and it prepared the hearts of the people long ago to understand a Messiah was coming. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, this, the study, uh, uh, the, how you've compiled this so beautifully. And coherently, over these many centuries, this word that we have, um, we thank you for the, the word and we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, above all, who is our redeemer, our rescuer, our king, our prophet, our priest, whoever lives to intercede for us. Thank you for the promises that he extends to us. Help us to stand on them unwavering with joy. Look forward to that day, we pray in Jesus' name.